but at the end of the day, we drove up a road called uh, Kingsgrade Road, and there was some guy standing in front of his house who had a long beard and was a tall guy. And I don't know if you ever stop people by the side of the road and ask them <laughs> if they know where anybody has planted wine grapes. But I think for the one time in our life, we actually did that. And it happened that it was Dick Erath. And of course, he knew where there were some wine grapes I'm sure he did. Uh, because he had done it three years earlier. From the studios of Kink Radio, it's the Portland 50, a podcast series about the people who dreamt, built, and championed the innovation, growth, and uniqueness of Portland. The Portland 50 series is brought to you by Jaguar Land Rover Portland. One company, two iconic brands. Jaguar Land Rover Portland is a Don Rasmussen company, the legendary Portland institution serving our community since 1950. I'm your host, Peggy LaPointe. Today, I talk with David Adelsheim, winemaker, founder, and now director of Adelsheim Vineyards, one of Oregon's founding wineries. David has also been given the industry's highest honor, the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Oregon Wine Board. We we decided we wanted to move from Portland. And I've got to say that it's sort of part of what was going on at the time. 1971, uh, we could rightly have been called hippies or at least some version of that. We wanted to not have jobs, uh, not be having to work for somebody else, having creating our own thing. But Jenny was a potter and a sculptor in clay, and I was fantasizing furniture building or musical instrument. Who knows what I was fantasizing? But back in those days, doing something on your own was really important. And we looked outside of Portland within about an hour because actually neither of us ever lived in the country before and had (laughs) no idea what that would be like. So we wanted to be able to get back to Portland if we needed to, you know, to get groceries or whatever. But when we went southwest of Portland, out over the Shala Mountains to Newburgh and and that area, we ran into a realtor in Dundee who sort of as a side point said that he'd heard that somebody had planted wine grapes out in that area. And we then spent the rest of the afternoon driving around on back roads looking for grapes, not with any fantasy about this. We still had no fantasy about wine. We just were intrigued by this idea because we'd been in Europe for a summer and, well, hadn't really visited wineries, but we'd seen a lot of vineyards and we'd taste a lot of wines and sort of the idea of food and wine together was very intriguing. And so we looked and looked and never found anything. But at the end of the day, we drove up a road called uh, Kingsgrade Road. And there was some guy standing in front of his house who had a long beard and was a tall guy. And I don't know if you ever stop people by the side of the road and (laughs) ask them if they know where anybody has planted wine grapes. But I think for the one time in our life, we actually did that, and it happened that it was Dick Erath, and of mm. course he knew where there were some wine grapes. I'm sure he did. Uh, because he had done it three years earlier. That was a small success, and then we found that we had a common friend. Uh, we, we met somebody who knew Bill Blosser, and she introduced us to Bill Blosser, and Bill and Susan invited us to a May Day party and there we met the Ponzi's and the Corys and the Letts. And at that point, we knew six of the first 10 people to make wine before 1980. That's incredible. Yeah. It was very fast. And we said, well, while we're looking for land, we really should we should find a south slope and should have jury soil because, you know, we might want to plant grapes. Did you ever wonder, had you gone northwest or northeast or southeast, what you would have ended up doing? Or if we hadn't looked for land that year. Right. Yeah. I don't know. That would be an interesting book or something. But no, I have no idea because we sort of fell into the wine business. I mean, literally, it seemed like it'd be really fun. (laughs) And nobody talked about making money and nobody really has made much money. So it's, it's been because of, in a sense, the joy the adventure, the life that you get to lead. I mean, I get to go all over the world talking about our wines. And back then it was all a fantasy because, of course, there was no reality to what we were doing. In fact, even had we been talking to people in California at that particular moment, their world was as much a fantasy as ours because there was 
virtually no such thing as a fine wine world in America. So uh, at this point, 1971, Mr. Erath had three years of planting. Was anyone bottling and selling wine at this time? So the first wine made in the Willamette Valley was made from the 70 vintage. So David Lett had um, planted the first vineyard. He planted some, a nursery row in 65 and then planted into the vineyard in 66. Those first grapes made wine in 1970. Mm -hmm. And he had wine in barrel, but nothing yet bottled when we met him and talked to him. We invited him over to our house in Portland later that summer, and he brought a bottle of his wine. It was the first Willamette Valley wine we'd ever had. What kind was it? Pinot. Nice. Of course. Of course. Uh, of course, it was not called Pinot Noir. What was it called? <clears throat> it was called Oregon Spring Wine. The price on this wine was $2.95, and David felt that it was not what he really wanted Pinot to be, mm -hmm. uh, and so he used this label to downplay the fact that it was what his fantasy of Pinot Noir was. It was a pretty good. You know, I still have two bottles. Do you really? Yeah. I've not op I've not had it in forever. I haven't talked to his son Jason in a while. We I I need to get together with him and invite some people over to try yeah. one of those bottles. That would be something. Yeah. That would be a celebration. Yeah. So then uh you planted in nineteen seventy eight. Well, we right. planted actually in 72, the 72. next year. Okay. Yeah, no, the problem with when people ask us, when was our winery founded? Pick a year. <laughs> I mean, in 71, we bought land. In 72, we started planting grapes. 74, we planted some more grapes. In 76, we made some home wine. 77, actually, the birds ate everything, so oh. we made no wine. But in 78, we made our first commercial harvest okay. and started selling that the next year. Do you still have any of that? Oh, sure. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. In 1994, you brought in a couple of folks as co-owners? Yes. Jack and Lynn Lowack. Yeah. That was really important. To a certain extent, our business has grown for a very long time without a carefully crafted strategy. It's not that we didn't think about what we should be doing, but totally understanding how a business which – really doesn't exist as sort of a cookie cutter kind of thing. Right. How it should grow was not clear. And we felt we wanted to make more wine, um, that we had a big planting of Pinot Gris mm -hmm. that was going to come into bearing in 19, excuse me, 1993. And if we didn't get a bigger press, it would take us about two weeks to press all those Pinot Gris <laughs> grapes. And so... The bigger press needed a bigger building, and so we started building the first stage of our new winery in 1972, 1992, so we could house this bigger press. That was actually a good choice, but in order to finance that building and the rest of the building, we needed partners who could actually make that happen. And so we brought in Jack and Lynn, and I think, strangely enough, they probably did it probably joined the company for reasons not that dissimilar from why we started in the first place. It'd be kind of fun and be cool and, uh, you know, you get to be a winery owner. How, how neat is that? Was this about the time when you were thinking we could make a go of it? Or was it before then that you realized that the grapes that you had planted uh, uh, were starting to produce what could be a <laughs> yeah, business? Yeah, that's a... Uh, that, that question is very close to what was the point in which everything changed. Mm -hmm. And there isn't that point because for the industry and for our winery, it was a succession of things that each built on what had happened before. I, I'm trying to think of what some of the big stages for us. We got the governor's medal at the state fair for 79 Merlot. There just were a, a range of little things that built. I mean, we'd been profitable almost every year since 83. <laughs> so it wasn't like we were a financial drain because there was no finances to be drained. And we were making a little bit of money and obviously paying all the bills and our employees, etc. But certainly in the 80s, it was not easy to sell Pinot Noir. I think one of the reasons that Pinot Gris took off in Oregon 
was because it could be sold quickly and at a price that people would step up for. Mm -hmm. And it nobody else in America was making Pinot Gris besides Oregon. And so Pinot Gris took off and replaced Chardonnay and Riesling as the white grape that mattered in Oregon. That growth helped provide some fiscal stability mm -hmm. to the industry, not just us, but everybody else who planted Pinot Gris. But I think at the same time, it was a detour away from where the wine industry now is going. And as people today think about what Oregon needs to become in terms of the wine business, more properly Willamette Valley needs to become, there's broad agreement that we're obviously going to focus on Pinot Noir because it's 73 percent of what's planted. But Chardonnay will be our white future, not Pinot Gris. Um, and that's because consumers will buy a range of Chardonnays because of the style that the winemaker imparts in that winemaking rather than because the grape variety is fun and enjoyable, which is the thing that was good about Pinot Gris that has now become its liability. Now you mentioned at that point Pinot Noir was not... No, it was really difficult to sell. Yeah, and so now we, at least I think of, or I love Pinot Noir, and I think of Oregon wine as being Pinot Noir. Yeah. At what point did Pinot Noir all of a sudden... Well, obviously Pinot. there was a movie. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that yeah. was, I think, 2005. Yep. Amazingly, uh, Sideways was about Santa Barbara County, and yet everybody in Oregon immediately sold out their Pinot Noir. What the movie did... It did for Pinot, not for Oregon. It took it from being one of the other grape varieties to being one of the big three. So before Sideways, there was Chardonnay and Cabernet. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, there was Chardonnay and Cabernet and Pinot Noir. You are not the only person in the world that likes Pinot Noir. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> and, and, and strangely enough, it's not just an American phenomenon. You think, well, the movie probably could make Americans into Pinot Noir love. The whole world loves Pinot Noir. Yeah. And places like Germany have, I think, four or five times as much Pinot Noir being produced today as before Sideways. Who knows what that movie did? It, it probably had this effect in a lot of places. But there's no question. I mean, people ask me, writers from all over the world ask me, so what's the next grape variety that is going to be famous in the Willamette Valley? Pinot Noir. 73%. Right. Do you need something bigger? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much bigger you can get. No, no, yeah. not no. No, it's all. amazing. The Willamette Valley is so unique in the in the new world of, of wine because we have this singular focus. You go to Washington, and they celebrated this last week that Cabernet is king in Washington at 38% because they grow Merlot and, right. and Riesling and Chardonnay and Syrah and... We grow Pinot Noir. Noir, and we will be growing Pinot Noir in spite of global warming and all the pressures that that puts on us. We will be growing Pinot Noir certainly for the foreseeable future generations to come because there are so few perfect places for Pinot Noir in the world. And that touches on a couple of things I wanted to ask you because I learned a lot from your website, by the way. Mm. Uh, it was really interesting not only um, the grapes that come from your estates, but also the grapes that you buy. Mm. Uh, one thing I noticed when you talked about the individual growers, on your website, you talk about where the grapes are facing, how far apart they're spaced, the location, uh, elevation, certification, the soils you list. Uh, I saw six different soils. There's a lot of science that goes into it, but uh, getting back to the elevation, I know with coffee, there were you know they have to mm. keep growing it higher and higher because of global warming. So does well, is that the same uh, thing? Well, that's with an grapes? exact analogy. Yeah. We can go up the mountain, right? Yeah, it'll be cooler if we go up. We can also go around the mountain to the north side, where there'll be less direct sun. It's less explored, mm -hmm. but it would certainly be a possibility. All of this, of course, is a huge financial problem because land doesn't just 
exist out there waiting for us to buy it. Right. But if we're talking generations of time, we bought grapes from a new grower this year who has grapes up the hill from us at 900 feet. We would have once said, well, you can't ripen grapes at 900 feet. But now you can. Now you can. What do Pinot grapes like the most as far as soil and elevation and all that? Hell if I know. <laughs> I mean, one of the biggest problems is, and I think it's not just an Oregon problem, it's a world problem, but we can look at the soils and we can tell you what we have and we can even tell you what what flavors that site seems to confer on the wines. And I, I'm going to go away from your question, but yeah, I'm going to come back to it. We did a, a charitable auction lot this past year where we invited nine wineries on our road to all bring their wines to a picnic with a bunch of consumers, and we had a big wine tasting. Well, they had a big wine tasting. I had the opportunity for the first time in my life to taste wines going up our street, oh. one next to the next. Oh. And there was a remarkable consistency once you left the bottom vineyard, which was a different soil, and you got into the soil that we're in, those wines, they were not alike, but there were large aspects of them that you could see the grapes were really similar because they came from a similar area. But what makes it similar? The soil only? We went from about 500 feet to about 800 feet. Mm -hmm. And the exposure, whether it points southeast or south or southwest or some version of that, and the steepness of the hill varied all over the place. So it's exasperating because we have really no idea <laughs> why these vineyards are so similar. It's driving me nuts to the point where I want to actually do some work on this mm -hmm. and see if we can define these neighborhoods because how cool would it be if we could communicate this to consumers that if you buy wines from this neighborhood, you can have an amazing winemaker and make great wine or a really crappy winemaker and you'll have crappy wine, but there are some inherent aspects to the wine that the neighborhood confers. And it's partially soil, but it's also the climate of this area that confers it because it's not just weather. Mm -hmm. Because year in and year out, we have these flavors. What was your real question? I don't know, but I that was good. <laughs> that, that, <would laughs> was a, that was an answer to another question. I, it was an answer to a question that I could not have thought of, but that would have been fascinating to taste these wines. Did you do it in a certain order? Or did you did, just... My tasting? Yeah. I did. I went up the hill. Okay. I, I'm, because they were arranged, I, we, we sort of set up the booths yeah. so that you started at the lowest elevation, went to the highest elevation. It was fascinating. Nobody else did it. The thing that we've come to realize is the smaller the place, this is not unlike what I just said, the smaller the place, the more specific the flavors. It's why in Europe they define big places, smaller places, and smaller and smaller places right down to the vineyard because there is, at least in theory and in some places truly, there is a flavor that is associated with that place that isn't possible anywhere else. And in the North Willamette Valley, we have this amazing experiment that almost doesn't exist anywhere else in the New World. With 73% of Pinot Noir, we have all these places where you can try Pinot Noir side by side, from far away, from close at hand, and we could actually explain to people what are the differences that are associated with these places. The individual vineyard, sure, but the fact that eight of those nine vineyards tasted so similar going up the road makes me believe, and I'm, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm making nothing up here, makes me believe that these neighborhoods have flavors associated with them that we could somehow define. I've gotten uh, out of at least two questions now. You have, but that's good. You're you're good at that. I'm you still... you're creating your own questions that I couldn't even think of because of your base <laughs> knowledge. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Now I'm curious because you n know so much about what you're doing, which you should. You've been doing it for 
40, 50, almost 50 40, years. Yeah, 46. And you just stumbled upon this yep. by chance. What have you, as you got more and more into it, as you got more and more curious about winemaking, where where did you go and who did you seek out mm. to get the information that yeah. you needed and wanted to grow your business? Smart question. Nice. See, I uh, thought of that one myself. No, you did totally, <laughs> and I'm not gonna mor- I'm not gonna morph that on you. And I've never been asked that question, so it's very cool. There are really only a couple of sources that we could depend on. Fundamentally, our friends in California who had been doing it a little bit longer though not much really with Pinot, but in terms of grapes and sort of how areas are set up. And and there's no no denying that Napa Valley was the first region to really focus on fine wine and get a reputation for doing wine extraordinarily well. And we've got great friends in Napa Valley, and they've provided specific answers when we needed them and examples when we just needed examples and continue to do that. I mean, I know I I was talking to a friend at another winery and they just did their management retreat in Napa Valley so that they could go out Mm -hmm. and look at a range of tasting rooms or wineries, depending on what kind of information they needed. And we've done that I don't know, four, probably four different times. We've gone to Napa Valley and talked to friends and and people we'd never met before about what they were doing and and why it worked. Now, this is not specifically about what to do in our vineyard, not how to make our wine, but how do you build a community? How do you build the resources to make your winery more stable and your region more stable? And they've done the best job of anybody in America. There's absolutely no way to question that. The other place we would go for questions about how to grow grapes and how to make wine are places that are more similar to Oregon than Mm -hmm. Northern California is in terms of climate uh, particularly. And that would be uh, Burgundy, of course, in France. And then uh, other parts of France and even... uh, some of the wine regions of Germany that, because I speak German, I ended up falling into conversations. And when before global warming, when we thought that Riesling and other things would be sort of part of our future in a bigger way than they've turned out to be, I spent a fair amount of time looking at issues in Germany uh, and bringing that information back to our community. But Burgundy continues to provide, what, clones? Um, other winemakers, because there are now seven winemakers from Burgundy that are making wine in Oregon. And so we're now teaching them Mm -hmm. how to make wine in Oregon, having learned it from them in Burgundy or some version of that. Burgundy remains our closest tie. Nobody in Oregon believes they're making Burgundy. Nobody in Burgundy believes that Oregon can make Burgundy. We want to make great Willamette Valley Pinots, in our case, or Chardonnays. I suppose my experience as two years or two months as a back waiter at Domaine Chandon is really no <laughs> that that when Daniel was there or before yeah. I don't even know it was two months when I I'm from Wisconsin originally uh, my sister was working as a chef at Domaine Chandon and for two months I got a job as a back waiter working there and it was in '89. Um, but that's oh. my wine. It's yeah, my, that, my that, that's your, your business yes. of wine experience. <laughs> that's where well, my expertise comes in. <laughs> the Psalm at the Maine Chandon helped Governor Reagan pick wines to be served at uh, when he was governor. And when he became president, was hired to go back and become the guy that picked wines to be served at the White House. That's pretty and awesome. he is still there until this month. And he retires at the end of this month. That's a long run. It's a it's a very long run, and he's become a great friend of Oregon, of us personally. He's just a wonderful person, and what he got to do is for every state dinner, he picked in consultation with whoever wanted to be consulted with mm-hmm. the wines to be served. But it was typically almost always American wine, unless there was a, a political point to be made by 
serving champagne to the French ambassador, but normally that would have been something sparkling from America to make that point. You're listening to Kink's Portland 50 series. I'll continue my conversation with David Adelsheim in a moment, but I wanted to thank our sponsor. The Portland 50 series is presented by Jaguar Land Rover Portland. One company, two iconic brands. Jaguar Land Rover Portland is a Don Rasmussen company, the legendary Portland institution serving our community since 1950. Now back to my conversation with David Adelsheim of Adelsheim Vineyards. What I am getting, the theme, the essence of your, not just your business, but your community, is this collaborative effort, this community that I think, from what I understand in large part, or, well, I'll say a large part, comes from you. You've been instrumental in the Shehala Mountain Wine Growers, uh, Willamette Wineries Association, and Oregon Wine Board. This is you with your love of what you do and your love of community and growing, knowing that the stronger the other wineries are, the stronger you, you are. And that's, some, and the, that's a statement and a question, but I want to hear more about that because that's yeah, instrumental. I'm delighted by your use of the word collaborative. It's a word we use a lot in the wine industry. As an example, we do an event every summer called Oregon Pinot Camp. Nobody can come to it because it's only for back waiters at Domaine Chandel. <laughs> I was going to say, where's my invitation? <laughs> <laughs> I'll for be people, waiting for that one. Pe- yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's only for people in restaurants and retail stores. It's mm-hmm. our attempt to educate them. And 270 people come now, not just from America, but from all over the world. And I'm sure that we tell them amazing things about what we do and how we grow grapes and how we make wine and why it's special and why it's unique and what they go away knowing is that Oregon is the most collaborative wine industry that they've ever come across. And initially, we did that without doing it as a goal. We did it because we couldn't have succeeded. I mean, literally, I, this is something that I, I try to say to people when they ask about the early wine industry of those first 10 couples. What did they know about what they were getting into? Farming, winemaking, selling, running a business. Well, one guy actually had made wine for three years at Martini. That's it. Nobody had ever grown grapes, although Pat Campbell at Elk Cove, Mm -hmm. she grew up on an apple orchard. Bill Fuller from Tualatin had made wine at Martini. Nobody had ever sold a bottle of wine and nobody had run a business. And I truly believe that the reason that Oregon and the Willamette Valley is considered such a success today and is not only here but growing ridiculously fast is because we understood that by working together, we could get much, much further than if we worked alone. And from the beginning, it was always important to have organizations that would pull people together. There were always monthly meetings of whatever the organization was called as it grew up. And we've done so many collaborative events that we almost don't think of events anymore unless we can think of, okay, how do you collaborate? The tasting on Hillside Drive, the nine wineries. We could have put together an auction lot, but it was more exciting for the people buying that auction lot that they got to see nine winemakers, not just one. That's always worked for us. One of my projects as I try to figure out the important things that still need doing is to defend collaboration Mm -hmm. and make sure that people understand how important it is to not just our past, but to the future of who we are. Because it is the only way teeny little Oregon that makes less than 1% of the wine in America can continue to have everybody's attention. We're like 25 or 30 percent of the wine stories written in America are about the Willamette Valley in Oregon. And yet it's one percent of what is produced. It's ridiculous. Well, there's strength in numbers. <laughs> Honestly. Well, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And now with almost 740 wineries in Oregon, there are a lot of numbers, but also a lot of reminders of why we need to work together that we need to continue to put out. One strong voice versus... 700 tiny voices is much more powerful. 
Well, you talked about the future. In February of 2017, Joth Riki from Stumptown came on board. He became the CEO, uh, taking over day-to-day operations, yep. which frees you up to focus on other things. Yeah. And what are those other things? Well, we've that, touched on some of them. I mean, yeah. that defensive collaboration, I, I've, I've got the title. Now all I have to do is actually write That's it. That's right. I yeah. said it <laughs> you. you. do the work. I, I'm the creative person. <laughs> you just call me whenever you need tips on back waiting stuff or, you know. You titles. know, we could have used that the other night. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I still have the skills. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. We've actually touched on a couple of them. The, the idea of the taste of neighborhoods mm-hmm. is something that I I want to do for the Shalem Mountains because we've long needed it. But it may be something that uh, could be expanded to the, the whole region because consumers would love to understand what is it that place is conferring. As wine drinkers, all we get is a bottle. We don't know what part of that bottle is due to the place, what is due to the grapes and the decisions that the people who planted the grapes made about grape variety, clone, rootstock, spacing, all that stuff, and how much of it is winemaking decisions, when to pick, how long to ferment it, just every little step, whether the barrels are all new or some old, some new, when did you bottle, what did you do? So. When you look at that bottle of wine, it's just one thing. And depending on what that bottle of wine is, could be more about place or less about place. Mm-hmm. Certainly a grape variety like Chardonnay, everybody knows that that can be highly influenced by winemaking. If it's a big, oaky, ripe Chardonnay, it seems like winemaking has an awful lot to do with how that wine tastes. Um, but if it's a much more transparent wine without as much oak and you can actually see the fruit, well, maybe you are looking at the place through that fruit. Uh, I think that would be an intriguing thing to do. There are a couple of other big projects that I'm trying to spend some time with. One is doing for the or helping the Willamette Valley in the same way that others have helped Napa Valley mm-hmm. to ensure that that it is held in the most in the highest possible esteem, that it's not denigrated. Uh, that people don't try to use the name for something of lesser value. And there are a range of sort of mostly legalistic things that could be done to help ensure that and to ensure that the whole industry is thinking about these things in the same way. So there's a lot of sort of small meetings to discuss these issues. And then the last thing, in my mind, takes a look at Napa Valley and, and recognizes that Most of my friends, particularly those of my age in Napa Valley, have said to me, boy, if it was today, I would not move to Napa Valley. How come? Because the place is overrun. Yeah. It isn't the fun place that they moved to in the 60s or 70s or whatever, whenever they came there. This is not to say that it's not a fun place to visit, Mm -hmm. but turning left on a Saturday onto Highway 29, you actually can't do that unless you've got a light. So it's a land use question. And what is Oregon's appetite for managing our success? Jack Davies, who founded Shramsburg in Napa Valley, had this conversation in the 70s with the Napa Valley Vintners. He asked, how can we keep from killing the goose that laid this golden egg? And we really have no excuse up here for not going and talking to the planning people in Napa County, Sonoma County, and Santa Barbara County, particularly in Sonoma and Santa Barbara, where the neighbors hate the wine industry. Any project that any winery proposes is fought. How can we get ahead of that? I don't have those answers, but they've got to be in those three counties at least some ideas that we could be acting on and talking about. Because otherwise, we're going to be faced with what's happened in Napa, which when it finally got to be so much, they made tasting rooms require appointments, and then they wouldn't allow tasting rooms And as, as people continued to want to add new wineries. Right. Is there a way that we could do something today that would allow some level of growth and new people to continue to come in without realizing that at some point 
the hammer will drop. Mm -hmm. It's going to take county commissioners, not just in our county, but a range of counties. Everybody wants more tourism to come to their tasting room. What does that bring? Right. And the communities in many ways depend on that. Yes. Yet. Yep. How do you, do you allow that? that to grow until X? Right. Manageable growth. Yep. Well, that'll keep you busy for a little while. Well, we'll a couple it. hours, I yeah. think. Yeah. 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 Saturday afternoon, yeah. and then you're good. Yeah. And yeah. then you can do some more tastings. Yep. Yeah. There was one other thing that I noticed. Uh, when I think of Adelsheim wines, I picture the uh, drawings of young women who I'm imagining are important people in your lives. Yes. But there's a new wine, because I noticed this new label, Breaking Ground Pinot Noir. Tell me about that one. Well, let me, let me tell you about... The, the long, young ladies? The, the ladies first, because yes. you, you hinted at that. If, if you step back away from our brand enough, it makes sense that... Our labels at the beginning were hand-drawn by Jenny, and she drew friends that inspired us and helped us. Barbara Pickett, who was on the old Chardonnay label, she and her husband force-fed us a lot of white burgundy so we could understand Chardonnay. Diana Lett, she and her husband were the first to plant Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley and were our best friends. I mean, it made sense to put these people on the label. But to some point, it also anchored us to this period of the... 70s, which in many respects we've grown away from. These people continue to have had that role, but obviously they're not having that role today. And there are lots of other things going on besides the people who helped us found it. And I think it was important for us to say we are not just a winery of the past, but a winery of the future too. And so we asked most of those ladies to retire. I can imagine they might come back in a some sort of special bottling at some point. But I think we did the right thing. I was talking to somebody in the trade a few years after we changed those labels around 2010. I think it was he who was asking sort of about the progress of the retreat of those labels. And I described them and he said, oh, you mean the old hippie label? <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of people that were pissed at us at that point, oh, that really? we changed the labels and that we took the women off and that the labels changed. And they are, they're changing in, again, as you just mentioned, because, in fact, our winery is changing. In the beginning, a winery like us, one of the first 10 wineries in the Willamette Valley, without an ability to see that we were going to end up where we are today, we kind of grew as best we could. The first thing we had to do if we wanted to make wine was buy a piece of property and plant grapes and then wait until those grapes bore and then make wine and then try to figure out how to sell it and how to put a label on it. I mean, all of that stuff. As we wanted to grow with no real money of our own, if people bought land and planted their own grapes and wanted to sell some grapes, then we could buy them. And mm -hmm. so we expanded by buying grapes from friends and neighbors, and, and that worked. And all these wines eventually were able to say Willamette Valley on them because we sent in a petition to the federal government allowing us to say that. But when we divided the North Willamette Valley up and started to acknowledge what we've already talked about in terms of place, we realized we had a choice, that we could make wines that blended across the North Willamette Valley or we could choose to focus on the flavors of that place where our vineyards were. And we've chosen the latter. Breaking Ground that you mentioned and, and its sister wine called Steak and Claim, which is a Chardonnay, those two are the first two wines that will really be our return to our origins. So when we bought that first vineyard and then the second vineyard and the third vineyard and our partners bought a vineyard and they bought another vineyard and we ended up with nine vineyards in the Shale Mountains. Managing the range of what those vineyards do gave us a level of expertise, not just in vineyards, but in the preliminary understanding of what we've talked about of, as to what those neighborhood tastes are like and which ones work together and which ones don't work together. Um, and so three years ago, we kind of looked at ourselves in the mirror and said, my God, we're shale mountain specialists. Nobody knows that, but that's our expertise. That's something that we know that nobody else knows to the depth and breadth that we do. 
why are we not capitalizing on that? Why are we not taking advantage of that specific and unique knowledge in what we sell to the public and help them understand how incredible it is to have a wine from this very specific place. So Breaking Ground in the 2014 vintage, as far as we know, it's the first wine ever from anybody to combine base wines from all three of the major soil types in the Shela Mountains. I like to tell people it's a wine, but it's also a research project (laughs) because (laughs) nobody's done this before. And, And Dave Page, our winemaker up until the end of this month, has said the first one was ridiculously difficult because of the pressure, because he was defining for the world what the Shayla Mountains meant. He said once once he sort of understood it, the wines have made themselves every year since that. I mean, it's not like he does nothing, right. but he has a vision. And if he tries to move it and experiment and make a wine that has less soil than he's had in the past, he keeps coming back to this sort of 40, 40, 20 blend of the three soil types as being the thing that not only is what we've done, but seems to be the most balanced wine where one thing doesn't take over. Oh, and we did the same thing with Chardonnay, (laughs) which is even cooler because there are no grapes. I mean, Chardonnay is like 5% of what's planted in Oregon. Right. It's nothing. And yet it's everybody's most exciting grape variety right now because the wines we make from Chardonnay in the Willamette Valley are nothing like New World Chardonnay, nothing like California or Australia or Chile or any of these places that are known for Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And so we're all collaborating on this, not exactly one-on-one vision, but this kind of force that Chardonnay is what we want to be known for in white wine. And I bet 10 years from now, we will be known for Chardonnay, too. You think Chardonnay is going to cut into the 73% of what Pinot is? It may not cut so much into the 73% as it will into the 15% of Pinot Gris. Okay. That makes sense. I think I'm going to wrap up with that. The evolution of Adelsheim as you've continued and reaching towards your 50-year mark Mm. to grow and to expand and to try new things sort of wraps up with Kink's 50 years of growing and experimenting and trying new things. When you were talking about that, I'm like, yes, in order to succeed for 50 years. When do I get to do the interview of you? (laughs) (laughs) In order for a winery to survive for 50 years and a radio station to survive 50 years, you have to constantly be rethinking what you're doing. Thank you so much for coming in and talking to me today. It was an unusual pleasure, actually. I didn't expect questions that, first question ever on a topic, for instance. That was great. I am an unusual host. Yeah, that's a true (laughs) statement. Thanks for choosing us to be part of this. Thank you. And happy birthday. Thank you for joining me for my conversation with David Adelsheim from Adelsheim Vineyards. If you've missed any of the previous podcasts, you can find them at our website, kink.fm. The Portland 50 is a podcast series celebrating Kink's 50th anniversary, and it's about the people who dreamt, built, and championed the innovation, growth, and uniqueness of Portland. The series is presented by Jaguar Land Rover Portland. One company, two iconic brands. Jaguar Land Rover Portland is a Don Rasmussen company, the legendary Portland institution serving our community since 1950.